Well, listen, I have um, been led today to talk with you about something that um, I've preached on before, uh, but it needs to be preached on very often because we all deal with it, especially in this day and time, and that is fear. Uh, I want to give you a working definition of fear before we even get in, into this so that you understand um, and we all will understand what we're talking about when we talk about this thing called fear. I don't have this up on the screen, but you can write this definition down that fear is to be afraid. Fear is to be afraid of someone or something. And listen to this, that could potentially be dangerous, painful, or threatening. I, I want you to, to latch hold of that word potentially, and, that's, and, and here's why. Uh, um, a study... Um, a study done on many, many different individuals uh, showed a few years back that 85% of our greatest fears are fueled by things that will never happen. I want you to write that statistic down, that 85% of what we fear may be the most um, are things that never even came to be. But how many of you know it doesn't matter if it's real, if it's real to you, it feels real? Okay, and so, so fear... It, it, it can be based upon facts, but a lot of fear can be based upon feelings and our perspective, good or bad. I want to share with you today how to overcome your fears. I'm going to share with you not only um, uh, five key things uh, that you need to know about fear, but how to overcome fear. They're, they're all wrapped into one. I want us to first of all look at this. Here's something you need to know. Fear is one of Satan's biggest tools used to keep us from experiencing God's best. Fear is one of Satan's biggest tools used to keep you from experiencing God's best for you. Listen, the first thing that we need to know every day we wake up, every night that we go to bed, is that Satan aims methodically and relentlessly to, to inflict fear into your life. Because he knows if he can get... Uh, fear to, to take hold of you, it will rob you of what God has for you. Listen, Satan uses fear every day of our lives to keep us from God and from also experiencing the fullness of God. Now, we know that fear comes from Satan because God's word is very clear that it doesn't come from God. Look at 2 Timothy 1.7. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear but a power and of love and of a sound mind. I think something I should clarify is that we're talking about a believer. See, a person who is not a child of God, a person who's not admitted their sin, believed in Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of their sin and the promise of eternal life and committed their heart and life to Jesus Christ, inviting him to live within them and to take over the lead of them, only that person who's, who's a true child of God in Christ has the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, living within them. Amen. So I, I want, I, that's something to notate because of this. Don't expect non-believers to have the confidence that only you can have as a believer. Because listen, the confidence is not from you. The confidence is in him. You know, how many of us would feel like we could be, um, you know, fortunate enough to go to heaven based on our works? I don't know about you. I'd be like, man, I'm not going to make it there if I'm having to just measure everything up. Satan knows the greatest battlefield takes place right here, right between those two ears, in that head of yours. Listen, Satan knows if he can consume your mind with fear, I'm going to give you a word that you need to know. You got to quit letting Satan hijack you, okay? We've all been hijacked before. I want to share with you some ways Satan uses fear, because as a lady once told me in my church, I've never forgotten it, she said, Pastor, she said, the devil ain't got but a few outfits. Will you please figure out what he's wearing and tell us? I'm about to tell you things that the devil's not going to want you to hear. So you can kind of expect we're probably going to have some phone rings, some babies cry, and, and uh, something happen while I'm trying to share this with you. Here's some different ways Satan uses fear. You can write these down. Satan uses fear to deceive you. Satan wants to feed you as many lies as you'll possibly believe. Fear is not always associated with reality. It's associated with the perception of reality. Fear is often associated with the reality that Satan wants you to believe. Satan leads us to believe that things are not only bad, but things are only going to get worse. And not just in the world around us, but even in our lives. Satan uses fear to discourage you. 
Satan hopes to fill your mind with things that not only knock you down, but keep you down. Listen, somebody doesn't become depressed overnight, by the way. It's when you've been held down so long, you no longer feel like you can get back up. See, listen, when you get to that point to where it's not just that you've given it up, but you feel like giving up, that's a very dangerous place. How many of you know that's the truth? If you have somebody in your life and you hear them going, hey, I just give up, you need to, take, you need to tune into those words, by the way. So that's a big, big deal. I don't ever, I can tell you this right now, it doesn't matter how many years I've been doing ministry, I do not walk away from anybody when I know it's just not a stabilized situation. If there's something that, that God's given me the ability to do or say or, or help with, with someone that's in a critical situation, how many of you know the most critical patients are in the ICU? Sometimes Satan has fed us so much lies that we are just deeply discouraged. But how about this one? Satan uses fear to torment you. Is fear ever fun? In fact, you always know that you're at a 6, 7, or 8 out of 10 when all you're thinking about is that fear. Okay? I want you to hear that. When, when you know that it's consuming you when it is constantly tormenting you. Satan uses fear to steal our joy, our hopes, our dreams. Satan also uses fear to paralyze you. I have, I have had times, I'm a very confident person, but I will be admitting to you right now, I've had many, many a time, especially as a pastor, where I have been absolutely paralyzed. I'm like, God, you sure, you sure that, that I'm the best you can come up with for, for, for this bunch? In fact, I mean it always when I tell you this. I am still searching for the next pastor of Refuge Church. I would like to work for him, work with him. I'll go out there and visit some people, encourage some people, love some people. Me and Brother Ronald, we're going to go out there and be the best care bearers that the world could offer. Um, but guess what? God keeps going, no, son, you got, in the game. You got to get in the game. But, you, but what the devil tells me sometimes is, hey, do you not see everything you're not getting right? Do you not see all the people who don't like you? How many of you know that sometimes you're more focused on the things that aren't going right and the people who don't like you? That's Satan. When you get emotionally paralyzed, you know that fear has overtaken you. Satan uses fear to keep you worried, to intimidate you. It makes you shaky. He wants to hijack you. He wants to derail God's plans for you. Listen, Satan is constantly seeking to take us down, to destroy us through this thing called fear. Jesus said this. I think it's John 10, 10. Jesus said, listen, the thief, which is Satan, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He steals your joy. He kills your dreams. He destroys your life. Doesn't happen overnight. The reason why we know that all of us need to take heed to hearing all that we can about this, this subject matter called fear, if fear wasn't a, a worldwide spread issue and such a big deal, then why would the Word of God address it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times? As some have said before, at least 365 times and counting throughout Scripture, we read the words, fear not, do not be afraid, don't worry, don't be anxious. Why? Because fear is always lurking at your door. And if you don't recognize it, it will just take you down. You have to recognize it. You can't, how many of you know that an issue doesn't run away just because you act like it's not there? Any of y'all ever had somebody say, listen, you just need to forget about it. And you're like, well, Sherlock, if I could forget about it, I'd have done forgot about it. And, 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 and listen, sometimes I pray about something just a minute ago, and it's already back at me. You know, I, I become this Indian giver with God. We have to understand that Satan is trying to inflict fear upon us, and certainly that's happening in our society, by the way. By the way, Christians need to make sure that we don't get as worked up as the rest of the world. The rest of the world's got reason to be worked up. But we've got to show them hope in the midst of the situation. Look at what 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, stay alert. Exclamation mark. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Listen, Satan, he, he um, preys on your greatest weakness. I don't know what yours is. I could list a mile long of mine. Whatever your greatest weakness is, that's what he's coming for. Whatever your greatest emotional vulnerability, whatever that one thing that always seems to trip you up, that greatest temptation, that greatest worry, he wants to keep coming through there because he's like, man, I can really get you there. But secondly, you need to know the fear of the Lord is wisdom, but all other fear is foolish. There's only one thing you should fear in this life, and that is the Lord. 
Here's how you should do that. You should recognize and submit to his authority. You should recognize that you wouldn't even be breathing right now if God wasn't pumping breath through your lungs. You need to recognize that at the end of this life, the only opinion that will matter will be God's opinion. Only what God says is truth and only what God thinks matters. Listen, the only healthy fear is the fear of the Lord because, listen, the scripture says this, this is the basis and the foundation for making a sound decision. Oftentimes when I'm preaching to you, stuff just circulates through me of how these things apply in my life. I've told people before, I'm, I'm so sure of my call, for instance, in, in Walterboro. You know, I know, it's, it, listen, I have, I have friends of mine that um, this is what they say when I tell them I'm called to Walterboro. They're like, bless your little heart. Well, that's not the way I feel. I say, bless their little hearts. Because um, I'm not a city slicker, okay? I like country folk. Um, I, I, I like, I, I, listen, something doesn't have to be perfect to be perfect for you. I feel very, very called to be here. And when I, when I, when I know I'm called to do something, um, that is the basis of my greatest decision. I mean, I, I, I've said it before because some, sometimes the only thing people can relate to is, is some people do things that they're hired to do, and then some people do things they're called to do. Well, when I know that I'm called to something, there's really nothing that could deter me from it. If, if the church right now was back down to three or four people, I'd just start it over. Now, you might sit back and say, well, man, he must not care about us. No, I'd invite you. But I'm just trying to tell you. That, 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 that my basis of my decision is not based on what other people do or what other people feel, but what should I do? It becomes the foundation for my life. I've never, in 27 years of ministry, my family has never gone anywhere that we absolutely didn't let the driving force be. Well, God was leading us to do that. We didn't have to have it figured out. The foundation for you making sound decisions in your life, in your marriage, with your children, with your, with your career, whatever it is, is saying, hey, I care mo most what God thinks. I care most what God thinks. Listen, every, there's always going to be people who don't see your side of things. You just need to make sure, like my daddy used to say, he said, I ain't got no friend, family, or foe. I just want what God wants. I want to be on God's side, and I want God to be on my side. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One, it results in good judgment. Listen, when it comes to having a fear of the Lord, this is not a bad fear like, hey, God's going to strike me down. Now, I have stated this before, that sometimes somebody will say something or do something, and I say, listen, I'm going to just step away because I don't want lightning to hit me. Okay? Okay. Uh, I mean that to a certain degree. I'm like, I have a healthy fear of the Lord, but it's not, I know that it's not what God um, is wanting from me, it's what God wants for me, okay? Anything even God asks from me is linked to what he has for me. He doesn't want me to have second best. He wants me to have his best. Listen, here's what a healthy fear of the Lord is. Write this down. It is, it is a sense of awe, reverence, and submission, it is a sense of awe, reverence, and total submission. In other words, you fear the Lord in such a way to where you say, God, I'm giving you, I'm giving you my, my, my past, my present, my future. I want what you want. You do what you want to do. God, I know that at the end of my life, you're going to give me my final report card. That, that usually drives me the most. Um, this is the second church that I ever started from the ground up, and, and I remember saying this before I didn't want to jump back into another church. I said, what would I do if I only had six months left to live? I literally had to do those scenarios in my mind. I said, would I just go to a church or would I start a church that I believe had a mission that could impact people that normally wouldn't be reached? And my driving force was, hey, I would do this because this is what I believe God wants me to do. Not what I wanted to do. I'm saying what God wanted me to do. You need to make sure that you're saying, God, whatever you want, I want. If you're not saying that, you've already, um, you've already reversed roles. Amen. You're telling God what to do instead of asking God what to do. Do you see the difference? Everybody comes to God and say, God, oh, bless me. Oh, bless my life, Lord. It's just, we're just so blessed. I, I want you to hear this. You can, you can reverence you can reference something that you don't reverence. Plenty of people talk about, oh, me and Jesus, preacher, we got our own thing going. I'm going, yeah, you got your own thing going, but I don't see Jesus anywhere in it. 
You can, listen, you can quote scripture, you can reference what you should do, and yet not be doing it. We all, we all have those times. Listen, you need to live, I want you to write this down, you need to live for an audience of one. And if you have to pick one audience, don't pick your spouse, don't pick your children, don't pick your parents, don't pick your friends, go with God. Go with God. I'm, go, I'm going with God each time. Why? Because God sees the whole picture. All of us, what do we see? Just a piece. Look at what Matthew 10, 28, Jesus says. He says, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body. By the way, the worst thing that can happen to anybody, you know what it is? It's not cancer. It's not a heart attack. It's not this, it's not that. It is to die and spend eternity in hell. It's the worst thing that can happen to anybody. See, anything that happens in this life, it can only happen so long. But your soul, which the Bible says is going to live on eternally somewhere, if it was to be condemned to hell and live in hell for the rest of eternity, that's terrible. Listen, you know how I'm able to tell whether or not you believe that or whether or not you care about the people around you? Who in your life have you not told about Jesus Christ? Who in, your life have you, who in your life are you not trying to do at least what you can to make sure they know Jesus Christ through you and from you? Listen, many people live in this world foolishly because they are constantly worried about what other people think when they need to be driven by what God thinks. The scripture says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Ephesians 5, 17 says, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. The, the foolish person is the person who gets up and say, hey, this is what I'm going to do today, God, like it or not. The wise person says, Lord, what do you want today? Where do you want me? Do, do you not think, I just want to let you understand about something about just the humanity of, of even ministry. Preachers don't sit at their house and sing hymns and just hold hands and pray all the time, Okay. No different than, than in your life. We, we, don't, we don't sit around, life's not perfect, and there are temptations, okay? Personally, um, I don't know why I'm thinking about Jimmy Buffett right now, but um, uh, I'll be glad if I was just sitting in Margaritaville every day and, you know, no worries, no shoes, no shirt, as they say, no problem. I, listen, if I didn't think that each day mattered in eternity, and that I'm going to give an account for each day in eternity, I wouldn't be seeing you today. I would not be here. Listen, I would be somewhere on a boat, and you'd see a video, and we'd be riding down the road just enjoying it. But you know what? I know that that's foolish. I know that that's foolish. Listen, today, biggest Sunday I've ever had. You know why? Because it's the only Sunday I got. Can't do nothing about last Sunday. Can't do nothing about a year ago Sunday. Right now is all I got. I want to I make sure that I'm doing today what I might not get to do tomorrow. And I want to make sure that that's God's will. Listen, outside of maintaining a healthy fear of the Lord, we have to seek to honor Him with our life because we will give an account to Him in the next life. All other fear other than of the Lord is absolutely foolish. You're fearing things that are nowhere near uh, as bad as you think. Look at Matthew 6, 27. Jesus says, can any of you by worrying add a single hour to their life? I'm glad God doesn't keep a log to show me how much time I spend worrying. Any of y'all? I'm like, Lord Jesus. You know, I, I, I probably would, listen, if God text messaged me all the things I've worried about, I probably would be like, listen, God, can I just read the first sentence and go on? It'd be that long. Maybe you're different. Listen, not one ounce of your earthly fears can add a single moment to your earthly life. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's the only healthy fear, and that's the only fear you should have. Number three, seek to feed your faith and starve your fears. This is where God's going to preach heavily to all of us. Seek to feed your faith and starve your fears. One thing we all can agree on, what you think and what you believe makes a difference in your life. When you wake up and you go, man, this is a God-made day, you feel good. And then there's other times you wake up and you're like, man, everything's upside down. And that shapes how you feel, and that shapes what you think. Listen, certain things can feed your fears, and certain things can feed your faith. You need to do everything you possibly can. Listen, this is the way I look at it. You have to position yourself 
for faith encouragement. You have to position yourself. A lot of people want to remove the disciplines of the faith. There's certain things you have to do because you won't keep growing. Okay, like, like after people give their heart and life to Christ, a lot of people would like to hit the cruise control. How many of you are like me when you drive, you like the cruise control button? You want to set it and forget it. But listen, that's not the way the Christian life is. If you're not growing forward, you're rolling backwards. If you're not walking in faith, you're walking in fear or in feelings. Listen, if we're honest, this world is constantly feeding our fears. How do they do that? What are all the most must-read headlines? Things that you read the headline, and you're like, say what? And y'all know what I'm talking about. You know, that type of stuff that, that while you're reading it on your social media, you're telling your spouse, you're like, let me tell you this. And we get all these things just fueling our fears. We flip on the TV, we turn on social media, we see things, we hear things, and then we digest things that because that's what we hear the most, that's what we believe most of the time. Ask yourself, when you look at your day-to-day -day habits, are they focused on things that feed your fears or do you intentionally seek to feed your faith? Trust me, it has to be intentional. My family and I just spent some days, days away. Even while I'm away, I, I, I allow things to be spoken into my life. I'm never off from Jesus, okay? I have certain pastors I listen to. I have, I have certain things that I, that I say, okay, well, you know what? I, I've, I've got to read that, 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 that scripture or, or, or this, this um, scriptural plan. I try to position myself to feed my faith. Listen, we all have times that we need to evaluate our habits. I'm going to tell you something right now that can help a lot of you. You need to understand that sometimes you do need to delete your social media, okay? Um, the reason I know the delete button works, it works a lot of times for me. Okay, I, I, I take things, uh, everybody lives on their phone nowadays. I delete things purposely that if I know that I've reached enough, I stop it. I delete it. I remove it from my life, not because I can deny realities, but because sometimes I don't need anything else to feed my fears. I don't need no more nonsense. Listen, I call it secondhand smoke. You can think you can be around crazy people and you not get crazy, you'll get crazy. And I'm sorry if some of them you related to. But I mean, listen, all of us, we have times where we just got to say, hey, I got I to gotta push this back. How many of you, you've been around negative, fear-driven people? And that gets all up in your business. If we're all honest, let's just think back on what we've dealt with just on all of our political twists. It's, it don't matter which side you own, you feel... You feel bad because you feel like you, you felt like in one of those seasons we just you can't you can't win, okay? You feel like you know there's nothing but there's nothing but fear there's nothing but division, and by the way the Bible says that God is not a God of confusion, and He's not a God of fear. Listen, it's not just about what I shouldn't do, but there are things that I need to do to feed my faith. I'm going to share some of them right here, even though they're things that you heard and and maybe do. You need to pray. Okay, you say, well, well, okay, Sherlock, I hear you. No, 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 no. You need to pray about it, not say you're praying about it. How many of you have committed that many a time? Let me just raise up all 12 fingers. I can tell you I'm praying and not be praying. I can tell you I need to pray about it and not be praying about it. Listen, some things aren't a dark prayer. It's a, it's a keep praying. Keep the gas down on the prayer pedal. Listen, instead of letting our fears consume us, we must trust God by faith with our fears through prayer. To me, when I get too long of a list of fears, because sometimes that just happens just because I deal with such an intake, I have to write it out. I write Dear God letters a lot because I've got to make sure that I put it in the hands of the one who can do anything about it. I got to make sure I get it off my shoulders because it just gets too heavy. You also got to do this. You got to focus on the praiseworthy. It's not about just positive vibes. I'm saying you got you to gotta praise God for what he is doing, not just, not just let Satan point out what you feel like he's not doing. Philippians 4, 6 through 8. I want you to hear this in the Amplified Bible. It says, Do not be anxious or worried about anything, but in everything, every circumstance and situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, continue to make your specific request known to God. God wants to hear your specific request. You say, well, well, God's too busy to hear this. No, he cares about it all. 
Verse 7 says, And the peace of God, that peace which reassures the heart, that peace which transcends all understanding, that peace which stands guard over your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, it is yours. By the way, here's the combo and the formula for peace. Pray about it and thank God for it. You pray about what, what you can't change, but you also thank God for what he's changing and what he's going to do despite whatever is going on. Verse 8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable and worthy of respect, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word. I want to say this one because this jumped out to me the most. If you want to know the will of God, you need to know the word of God. Okay? The word of God has to be your filter. Quit letting it be culture. Quit saying, hey, well, this is 2021. It don't matter if it's 2021, 2061. The word of God does not change. And we do have to stand firm on that. Listen, even if everybody around you says, well, it's okay, it's right, or it's accepted. If it's not right, in God's eyes, it's not right. And if it's not right for you, it's not good for you. It says, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word. Listen, before you ever make any decisions in life, ask yourself and check for yourself, does God approve of this? Because if he doesn't approve of it, then you don't have his blessing. It says, whatever is pure and wholesome, whatever is lovely and brings peace, whatever is admirable and of good repute, if there is anything of excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think continually on these things, center your mind on them and implant them in your heart. Throughout my years of ministry, I've had to, um, I've had, just as much as I've had to create a pr- prayer list, I have to maintain a praise list. Because if I can't see what God did good, then all I see is the bad. You see? I, 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 just like you, have plenty of people who misread me, plenty of people who don't like me, plenty of people who have disheartened me. That is life. By the way, you're not the only person. That is life. God is good. People are crazy. Me and you might be one of them. We have to choose to pray about everything, but we also have to find the praiseworthy through everything. How can you find comfort and hope if you can't find something to praise God about? You know, I, obviously, you know, all of y'all know I'm, I'm, I'm still grieving my dad's death. In fact, I hadn't thought about that one time this morning. And, and, and we all know grief, what, what does it do? It just throws you around. You know, it tosses you, turns you. Um, you can get all into your feelings. But I have so many good memories of my dad. Those things so far outweigh the, the hey, what ifs, and, and, and I hate that, and I hate that. I also know where my dad is. And I'm like, man, how can I not celebrate that my dad is in heaven? How can I not celebrate that in Christ, me and dad, will see each other again later? Listen, that's when something moves from from instead of just um, something that you you wallow in, you praise God for. You can be struggling and still praise God. Listen, if you can't find a reason to praise God when you get up, you normally can't find a reason to get up. We have to meditate on God's word. I want you to write that down. You have to do that. If you, if you haven't memorized the scripture any time in any recent time, it doesn't matter how many scriptures you know. You've got to meditate on the word of God because you're constantly being fed words. And normally it's not God's word. Listen, the primary way, here's why you need to meditate on God's word. The number one way God speaks is through his word. Um, I've tried to look at clouds just like y'all. Y'all ever look at a cloud and you're like, a cloud and you're like, that cloud is the shape of a cross. Hey, did you see it looks like three angels over that thing? You know, or somebody reads their horoscope or, or, or you, have, you have this or that happen. And I do believe God speaks many ways, but I know this for certain. He speaks through his word because you know why? The word of God is the voice of God. It is not just words on a paper. It is insp- the inspired word of God. It, by the way, the Word of God is the only book you'll ever read that doesn't contradict itself. You read any other book, it's going to contradict itself. But God's Word somehow, from Genesis to Revelation, does not run into each other. In fact, it's married. It takes you clean from the old to the new, and all of it's relevant. 
Scripture says in Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You would not have known the gospel of Jesus Christ without the word of God. You cannot continue to have the mind of Christ without knowing the will of God, which is found in the word of God. But there's one other thing, and I'm going to make sure, in case this is the recorded version of this message, there's some people listening to me right now on on sitting on a couch or riding a car and this and that. And, and listen, we're glad to have any of the viewers that we have listening to things. But I want you to hear this very clear. It does not matter how much times have changed. We all need some Jesus with skin. Watching a service online, listening to your favorite pastor or church on, on TV, it cannot substitute for real relationships. You know why real relationships matter? It's what our care groups all stand for. Compassion, accountability, relationships, encouragement for everybody. It's nothing magical, but it's something powerful. Amen. Scripture says, wherever two or more gathered in my name, there I am. Listen, there comes a point where you have to have people around you all. You know what Sundays are, by the way? Pet rallies. Did anybody bring their pom-poms? We might start letting y'all do that. Bring y'all, and you can bring a, um, what do you call those, uh, those little shakers? You can bring those if you know how to shake them in rhythm. But how many of you know that you need encouragement every week? Do you ever have a week where you don't need it? Can you be too encouraged? I've never heard anybody say, listen, I am struggling. I have too much encouragement syndrome. I don't know about you. I can't be encouraged too much. The Bible says that we need to keep coming together. We need to quit thinking that just because we message people on a phone that that substitutes for real relationships together. Listen, when I see your face and I can see your expression and I can feel your love, how many of you like hugs? I'm a hugger. I love me some hugs. In fact, listen, I'm willing to stay after service as long as I need to, and I'll take however many hugs you got, okay? Uh, I've had all my shots, by the way. I, I love hugs. I don't know what it is about a hug, but, but listen, you know what the hug does? It's just like, it's like the presence of God, isn't it? It's like the presence of God. Sometimes, you know what? You come to church and you just need to be hugged. You don't need to be fixed. You just need to be loved. And I, by the way, here at Refuge Church, you can be real and you can be loved and you can be right where you are. But you know what? We love you way too much to leave you there. Who would want to leave somebody? Who would want to deny somebody at God's best if they could do better? Hebrews 10.25 says this, Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. It is foolish to me to think that people think that now church is irrelevant when church is more relevant than it's ever been because we need a break from the insanity. We need a good word. We need an encouraging thought. Listen, meditate on Scripture and digest God's Word. Gather with other believers, not just in here, but outside of here. I, we always hope this. Find a relationship with somebody in Christ who can encourage you more beyond these walls. Listen, pray about what is bothering you. Don't just wallow in it. Focus on what God has done, is doing, and will do. And focus and celebrate the praiseworthy. I want you to write this down. You can't move forward by faith while you are completely blinded by fear. You cannot move forward by faith completely blinded by fear. And if you don't feed your faith, Satan will feed your fears. There's no such thing as standing still. There's either I'm being still and knowing that he's God or I am just all in to what Satan's feeding me. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. You will never accomplish anything God-sized, no matter what God's called you to, except to walk by faith. How many of you know that if you went by your feelings, you'd have been a fool so many times? I mean, I, my feelings are always trying to grab me. I'm finally learned, I'm, and my wife keeps telling me, you can't say everything you're feeling either. How many of you know that? Okay? I'm not showing all my cards to y'all today. I, I take y'all right to the brink, but I'm not that crazy, okay? But all of us, we have things we think, we have things we feel, and if we're not careful, we let our feelings guide us and our faith is left behind. But fourthly, you need to know that God is greater than your greatest fear. To me, this one's my biggie. This is what takes it over the ledge. 
You need to know that God is greater than your greatest fear. Too often we are seeking to rely on self-confidence instead of God confidence. When, when God led me to start this church, he made it very clear to me. He said, Craig, this time around, don't build church on the Craig. Build church on Christ. I want to be, I want this church to be a body of committed, compassionate, sold out, love lifting, leading believers that no matter who's here or who's not here, God is here. I'm wanting some of you to be that person to where you, 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 you just say, God, I know you're greater. God, you use me. God, you, I'm putting my confidence in you. Listen, any confidence in anyone other than Christ is a misplaced confidence. God never says you can overcome anything yourself. God does say you can overcome anything with him in your life because God is greater than your greatest fear. Listen, listen to what God says in Isaiah 41.10. Don't be afraid for I am with you. Don't be discouraged for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Did you hear any I other than him? He says, I will do it. In fact, he's doing it in your life. Listen, some of you, you'd have been falling apart if he wasn't holding you together. What are you facing that may be way over your head that you can't fix, let alone even endure? But with God, listen, in you, with you, and for you, the scripture says nothing is impossible. I, I want you to understand this. The reason why you want to get things confirmed by the Word of God is you want to make sure you're in the will of God. And when you know you're in the will of God, then you can expect the greatness of God. When I talk about this church often as I, as I do, because again, we're gathering together. I'm, I want to keep being as transparent. I learned over the time in ministry, you can't talk about the fundamentals too much. I've got to keep dialing you in, keep telling you, hey, it's not about you, it's about him. It's not about our mission, it's about his mission. It's about us becoming full, sold out vessels for God to use to do the impossible. And we can do more together than we can apart. But the reason I expect so much for the future is because God has given me such revelation about the future. And so I expect the impossible with him, even though I can't tell you how it's going to be possible. I, I, I could list out for you right now that I have more questions right now in my life than I have answers. I have more question marks than I do exclamation marks. But I'm going to tell you right now, the, the exclamation marks I do have, they're pretty strong. They're pretty sure. I know what it's like to have a dream, for instance. I was thinking about this just recently, just to have a dream and and, and, and for people that I'm looking at right now, to be, to be, you were in that dream and you just didn't even know it. And, and sometimes, listen, when you, all you do is obey God and trust God and then you see God, it makes you want to trust Him more. See, the more that you discover the greatness of God, the more you will never discover anything that's greater than God. Look at what Jesus says in Luke 18, 27. Jesus says, what is impossible with man is possible with God. What is it in your life that you can't, but he can? It's okay for you to say you can't, but make sure you're not answering for God and limiting God by what you can do. Listen, when you pray for a miracle, for a situation that's beyond medical help, do you pray with human expectations or do you pray with God expectations? You're like, listen, God, I know if you don't intervene, nothing can happen here. And by the way, I've seen God raise the dead to life. I've seen so many situations where if I'm really honest, while I was at the bed of that person, I'm thinking there's no chance, God, but I, hey, I believe all things are possible with you. And next thing I know, I'm like, what did they just say happened? I've seen enough miracles to believe God for more. Romans 8.31 says, if God is for us, who can be against us? The reason you want to make sure that you are where God wants you to be, who God wants you to be, seeking all that God wants for you to do, is because if God is for you, nothing can be against you. Scripture says, be still and know that God is God, that he is greater than your greatest fear. Listen, some of you need to know this. He's greater than your past mistake. Some of you have bought the lie from Satan that what has happened in the past will define your future. 
You are being held hostage. You have been hijacked. And you need to be set free from that. You need to no longer be a slave to fear. You can live that way the rest of your life. You will leave, live that way the rest of your life if you don't choose faith over fear. Listen, God is greater than your greatest giant, your greatest challenge. Sometimes you, you really have done everything you can do. Some of you have situations you know you've done everything you could do and you're doing everything you know to do. And you need to know where you end and where God begins and how you have to trust God. I, I've given you this definition of faith before, but I live by it every day. Faith is doing everything that you can do while trusting God for everything you can't do. There comes a point where you say, okay, God, I'm fighting as hard as I can, but most of all, I'm letting you fight. I'm trusting you for the victory. Exodus 14, 14 says, the Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. How often do we have to tell ourselves that? Do we have to be reminded of that? God wants us to fear less, to trust him more. Joshua 1, 9 says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid or, or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I told you before, my 11-year-old, when I, I think probably at 9 or 8, he taught me a word, courageousness. He'd be in the middle of prayer, and he's like, and God, give us courageousness. I'm like, God, if you didn't just bring a word through him. We need courageousness. Not, listen, not courage in ourselves, not courage in our economy, not courage in our president, not courage in the people around us. Courage in Christ, victory in Christ. Listen, God is with you. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He is all-loving. He is always faithful. He is always there. And no matter what life brings you, God is going to be greater than what comes against you. You need to know that you, if you're where God wants you to be, who God wants you to be, trust in God's purpose and plan, God is fighting for you. He's not, it, it, listen, you don't have to, uh, it, the, I can't remember the scripture verse right now, but it, it, you can look it up, um, it, where it says the God of peace will soon crush Satan. Did it say you would crush Satan? Satan's bigger than you. That's why you needed God. That's why you needed Jesus. But last but certainly not least, I want you to hear this. Even in the darkest valley, you don't have to be afraid. Even in the darkest valley, you don't have to be afraid. Listen, anyone living in this world knows that it is full of ups and downs. In fact, you could argue that sometimes it's full of more valleys. And the scariest times are definitely in the darkest and, and lowest valleys. And, and before I address uh, what I want to say right here, I, I, I want you to hear me that, um, that, that next week, next Sunday, actually, we're going to look at how God works in the valley. How, how, how God purposely works in that valley and what you can do in that. But right now, I want us to look at what King David learned through one of the most difficult seasons of his life. At this time, David has been literally run, run out of his throne. He's running for his life. His own son is, has run him out of, of his throne, and his army is threatening to take David's life. And here are the things that gave David great comfort, even in one of the darkest valleys of his life. Psalm 23. This should not just be read at funerals. This was not about a funeral. Listen to it. Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Notice that follows that. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. I want you to read that with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He, he lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. Again, keep watching this emphasis on he. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Listen, just because it doesn't make sense to you and it seems to be the most tragic thing that ever happened does not mean that God isn't using it to bring about the greatest things that could happen. I mean, I'm sitting here right now thinking about my, my, my brother who should have been dead five years ago with alcohol. Anybody who's ever watched somebody battle with alcoholism, you know it's just not a pretty picture. I can still remember showing up at his house in, in Orlando, begging him to walk out. I paid five, six hundred dollars to, 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 to fly him from one place to another just to get him to hope before. And what I found was God was using everything that he went through, not only for his good, but our good and his glory. Listen, don't worry about the path you're on. Make sure that you are on the right path. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Listen, there will be plenty of things that when we get to heaven, we'll realize God used, and most of it was in the valley. 
Verse 4 says, even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. I want you to hear that declaration. Say that with me. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. One more time. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. Here's why, he says. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect me and comfort me. I believe that God surrounds us with a band of angels. He says, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Now listen, here in this psalm, we find so much truth that can give us comfort, confidence, and help us overcome our greatest fears. First of all, you need to know that David declared that even while he was walking through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid because God is with me. Here are seven things every believer can depend on. I must tell you these real quick. Seven things David learned that we have to learn in the valley. Number one, God will provide all I need. God will provide all I need. Wherever God guides, he provides. If God calls you to something, he will equip you for the task at hand. Number two, God will give me rest and peace. No matter how low your valley, Jesus can give you peace and rest. Listen, in the valley, his type of peace does not make sense. You can, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You can have peace and still have chaos around you. If you couldn't, you couldn't have peace. Most of us, listen, during COVID, nobody would have found peace. Listen, you've got to turn to the Lord and you've got to turn everything over to the Lord. Number three, God will strengthen me. Listen, if, 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 it's, it's, it's when all your strength is gone that you find your greatest strength. I don't know about you, but I found my greatest strength in Christ when I ran out of my strength. I didn't get there until I, until I reached my weakest moment that God didn't become real. Before that, I thought I was strong. Anybody else thought they were strong until they weren't? Next, God will guide me. Scripture is clear that when we seek God with all of our heart, God will lead our hearts towards his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Sometimes all you can do is take the next right step. That's why you hear me say it often. Keep taking the next right step, and that step will lead to the next right step. Also, God will be close beside me forever. Listen, for the believer in Jesus Christ, here's the greatest hope I can give you. You will never, ever, 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 ever be separated from the hand, the presence, and the love of God. Whether it be in this life or the life to come, by grace through faith in Christ alone, nothing can separate you. Whether in this house or the house to come, the mansion that God's prepared for you, you'll never be separated. But also God will protect and comfort me. There may be some valleys and giants in front of you, the challenges you are facing way bigger than you. But listen, nothing you will face will be bigger than your God. God will watch over you day and night. He will protect you, listen, from the flaming arrows. Sometimes, listen, sometimes Satan's attacking so quickly you can barely even hold your head up. Now, by the way, that's when you need to phone, phone a friend. And if you can't get a friend, you call the preacher and he'll be your friend. God will protect you. Has God not always protected you? Has God not comforted you through some things that you thought you couldn't get through? He'll do it again. But last but not least, you need to know God is always going to be good and loving. He's always going to be good and loving. You know why? Because he is good. And he is love. David learned throughout his life, and, and especially in the deepest valleys, God is always good, God is always love, and listen, God is always greater than your greatest fear. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, only you know what each and every person is dealing with right now. Lord, but I know that we all wrestle with this giant called fear. God, help us to, to cast all of our fears, all of our cares, all of our concerns, all of our worries of yesterday, today, or tomorrow, may we cast all that on you. God, we thank you that you are greater. Lord, that greater are you that is in us, Lord, than anything that would come against us in this world. God, man, and certain things, Lord, may, may do things to the body, Lord, but you hold our soul in your hands and nothing can separate us from your presence, your peace, and our destiny in you. God, I pray for that person right now, Lord, that they've been through so much stuff, they just, they've really just lost faith. They're so discouraged. Lord, in fact, they're depressed. 
Lord, they, 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 they just have a hard time just seeing beyond where they are. But God, may they understand right now, you see right where they are as well as where you're taking them. God, I pray for that person, Lord, who, who tr- genuinely wants to put it all in your hands, Lord, that right now they would declare that I will not be afraid, Lord, because you are with me. You will guide me. You will comfort me. You will protect me. You will strengthen me. You will not leave me. God, I pray for that person, Lord, that, that, that they, they just keep um, trying to take the next steps, Lord, by faith, but they've got something going on in, in their family. They got something going on in their own personal life, Lord. They got something going on with a friend or, or other things around them, Lord, just things that are weighing heavily upon them, God. I just pray they, they would know, God, you are greater than their greatest fear. And, Lord, you know how to work all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose for them. God, I pray for that person who might be listening right now. Lord, they have no idea who you are. And they've never believed in your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, they need to know right now, God, that you so love the world that you sent your only son, Jesus, to die on a cross for their sins, my sins. So that if we believe in him, Lord, we would not... Spend eternity in hell, but Lord, be able to be forgiven and spend eternity in heaven with you. God, I pray, Lord, if there's anyone listening right now that's not said, Jesus, please forgive me. I admit my sin. I believe in you, Jesus, God's son, that you died on the cross for my sins. And that you were buried and that you arose the third day, overcoming sin and death in the grave for me. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my savior be my Lord, my leader. God, I pray if anyone's made that commitment today, they would let someone know, they would let us know, Lord, that they have now been become spiritually reborn, Lord, not physically, but spiritually reborn. Lord, those are going to be the only people that make it to heaven. Lord, those are the only people that can have peace. Lord, we can only have that in Christ. So God, we give you everything in our lives. We give you everything going on in the lives of those around us. We give you our, our fears and our failures. And we trust you forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us? This altar is going to be open. Uh, you are welcome to come down here. But also, if you would like to pray with me and, and, uh, and, and, and me pray with you, I'd, I'll be right here at one of these seats.